Anyway, welcome tonight. Thank you all for coming. And we're delighted and honoured to have with us um, Kayla Mikalian, who hails from Iran originally, but now is Australian, and is one of a great number of about 30,000 Armenians living in this country, all of whom have interesting professions and careers. If they're not lawyers or doctors, they're panel beaters and spray painters. <laughs> Most of them are situated in Sydney and Melbourne, and they add a great deal to the uh, multicultural mix of this great country of ours. Kayla is going to talk about Nagorno-Karabakh. I, I knew nothing about it. I mean, when I was in Iran for two years, uh, Azerbaijan up there on the western side of the Caspian Sea was important, but then it was a Soviet, it was part of the Soviet Union. And so was Armenia, and so was uh, half the, all of that area. It's only since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union that Azerbaijan became an independent country, and so did Armenia, with nagorno karabakh in the middle of both of them. As you can see from the map, where is it? Yes, there it is, nagorno karabakh It's between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's sort of a pimple. 150,000 people wanting their independence, nominally so, uh, mentally the people think that they have it, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, an antagonism from Azerbaijan. And tonight, Kayla is going to talk about this. Why is this important to Australia? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the whole of this area, the whole of the readjustment of these countries to the south of the former Soviet Union, their, their stability, their independence, what's going to happen to them, is very important. And this is a trade route. It's a strategic trade route be between Europe and the Middle East. It's all important. And our, our mission is to is to inform and educate Australians about foreign policy, and that's what we're doing tonight. So, Kayla, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Mr. Richard Bernowski, President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, New South Wales Branch. Mr. Jonathan O'Day, Mem MP, Member for Davidson and Chair of the Armenia-Australia Parliamentary Friendship Group in the New South Wales Parliament. Distinguished guests in terms of the AIIA, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a daunting prospect to stand at this lectern where many distinguished diplomats and political figures have stood. The many issues that they have discussed would have great international significance. And what I have to say to you tonight also has major international significance and needs to be a topic of discussion even in faraway Australia. And I thank, uh, I thank the AIIA for this opportunity because it gives me an opportunity to discuss something that is important to Australia as well. By the way of an introduction, my name is Kayla Mikhailian and I was appointed the permanent representative of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, in Australia on October 22 last year. I was born in Iran of Armenian parents, tracing their heritage back to the city of Shushi in Artsakh, in nagorno karabakh Artsakh is the name that the Armenians give to that area, which internationally is recognized as nagorno karabakh and my ancestors were removed from this particular area by the Persian king, Shah Abbas, in 1604. I am the 13th generation of Armenians living in Iran. I was born in Iran, as I said. I studied in Iran and then moved on to Calcutta in India and migrated to Australia with my family in 1975. From virtually the day of my arrival in Australia, I became involved within the Armenian community in Sydney and have been an active member of the community for over 40 years. I have served as the principal of the Goldston College in Ingleside for 14 years, as chair of Armenia Media, as a member of the Armenian National Committee of Australia for over 10 years, and held various and varied roles within our community organisations. 
I visited Armenia and Artsakh with my family <coughs> for the first time in 2003. And since then have made yearly pilgrimages and at times twice a year to the, to the homeland. It is a great honor to be called to serve the people and the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh as their representative in Australia. And today I want to take you on a journey with me of the tale of two Armenians, Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia proper. A very brief look at the history. The Kingdom of Artsakh is part of the ancient Armenian Kingdom, and it is first mentioned in the inscriptions of the Urartian kings, the Urartians were Armenian kings, Sardur II in 763 BC. It has a, a history stretching from times immemorial and its indigenous population being the people of Haik or the Armenians. Dikran the Great, the only emperor the Armenians have ever had, had an empire stretching from the Caspian Sea to the Mediterranean. And he had decided that on the four corners of his empire, he was to build cities bearing his name. I was fortunate last year in October when I visited Garabakh to visit the site of excavations of one of his cities called Tikranagird, dating back to 55 BC. This particular city had remained unknown because the, during the past 70 years the Azeri government had decided that no trace of anything Armenian should exist in Nagorno-Karabakh and had brought in incredible amount of dirt, rubble and covered this particular city to wipe the traces off the face of the earth. Fortunately, after the liberation of Nagorno-Karabakh Artsakh uh, our archaeologists rediscovered the site and I was a witness to the great treasure that is the Kranakert. The reference to the region as Karabakh, which is a Turkic and Persian word, meaning black garden, Gara in Turkish means black, and Bagh in Persian means garden, appears only in the 13th and 14th centuries in Georgian and Persian inscriptions. And it comes after the Turkic races from Central Asia had settled on the, um, in the Armenian plateau in the 11th century. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict with Azerbaijan is of course one of the most cruel and protracted confrontations in Europe. As a dispute, the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh emerged in 1918 with the fall of the Russian Empire and the raised with the fall of the Russian Empire, there was a necessity to demarcate the borders of the newly independent Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan. I think it is worth mentioning that the first ever Azerbaijani entity was not recognized as a member of the League of Nations, the antecedent of the United Nations, for its territorial claims towards its neighboring states which included Nagorno-Karabakh from Armenia and even parts of Iranian Persian Azerbaijan. The instability in the region lasted until 1920 when Armenia and Azerbaijan were Sovietized and Joseph Stalin was pressured by the Azeri political figures like Narimov to incorporate Nagorno-Karabakh into Soviet Azerbaijan. With the stroke of a dictator's pen, Stalin gifted Artsakh and Nakhichevan to Soviet Azerbaijan against the will of the indigenous Armenian population who, compromised, who comprised 95% of the population of the region at the time. 
to somewhat appease the Armenian population of Karabakh, an autonomous oblast or enclave was declared and the autonomous oblast of Nagorno-Karabakh was formed under the administrative powers of the Azerbaijani Soviet Socialist Republic. During almost seven decades of Nagorno-Karabakh's existence within the administrative structure of Soviet Azerbaijan, a part of the Soviet Union, the authorities in Baku regularly isolated and violated the rights of the I mean, of the people of the Armenians of Karabakh, hampering the region's economic development and implementing a policy of deportation of Armenians from nagorno karabakh thus transforming the demographic composition of the region in favor of, Azerbaijani, of the Azerbaijani minority. These intentions were clearly and openly stated by many Azeri leaders, including Haydar Aliyev, father of the incumbent Azerbaijani lifetime president, Ilham Aliyev. As a result, about 3% of the Azerbaijani population in Karabakh in 1923 increased sevenfold to form 21% in 1989. Armenians in Karabakh repeatedly raised these problems with the central Soviet authorities in Moscow, but to no avail. Moscow did not, did not tolerate any kind of dissent and would not countenance any rocking of the boat of their utopian system. Formation of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. With the elevation of Mikhail Gorbachev to the position of General Secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR and his introduction of the policies of Perestroika and Glasnost, the Karabakh Liberation Movement seized the opportunity to push for, to secede from Soviet Azerbaijan and to unite with Soviet Armenia. On September 2, 1991, only three days after Azerbaijan had announced, and this is their announcement, restoration of its independent Republic of 1918. This is a very, very important statement for the Armenians. So they res restored their independent Republic of 1918, which as I mentioned, did not include Karabakh at the time. Nagorno-Karabakh was not a part of the Republic of Azerbaijan in 1918. The Karabakh legislature also adopted a similar declaration proclaiming the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent state. These actions were in complete compliance with the Soviet law of the day. The law provided autonomous entities with the right to decide independently their political and legal status through legally binding expression of will in case of a Soviet Republic de declaring withdrawal from the USSR. Formation of the nagorno karabakh Republic was sealed by the 10 December 1991 nationwide referendum in compliance with international law and then acting legislation Almost 99% of the population supported independence of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. The Azeri minority in Karabakh was also provided the opportunity to vote. Yet, after receiving signals from Baku, Azerbaijanis in Karabakh exercised their right to boycott the referendum, which in any case could not have affected the final result of the vote. Therefore, as a result of the Soviet Union's disintegration, two states were born, the Republic of Azerbaijan and the nagorno karabakh Republic. And they were established as fully complying states within Soviet law. The Declaration of Independence by the nagorno karabakh Republic brought a swift and violent response from the Azeri authorities who categorically rejected Karabakh's right to self-determination. Azeri authorities had already shown their determination 
to crush any Armenian attempt to secede and had orchestrated in early 1988 when the Karabakh legislature had pet petitioned the Soviet leadership to restore historical justice and reconsider its status within the USSR, a wave of anti-Armenian pogroms in major cities in Azerbaijan, in Sumgait, in Baku, in Kiribati, claimed dozens of lives and escalated the peaceful manifestation into a military confrontation, creating the first flow of refugees in then the Soviet Union. Subsequently, unwilling to accept the formation of an independent Artsakh, Azerbaijan launched a full-scale war, the war which killed and maimed dozens of thousands of lives and devastated the entire economic and social infrastructure in Karabakh. The Armenians of Artsakh emerged victorious after a three-year-long war and earned the right to live in freedom under a government of their own choosing. A Russian-brokered ceasefire agreement between Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Armenia. It is important to highlight that this ceasefire was between three parties. It was between Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Armenia, and it was signed in May 1994, and remained in force up until only last week, on April 2, 2016, when Azerbaijan unleashed a violent attack along the entire line of contact between the MKR and Azerbaijan. As most of you would know, there have been heavy civilian and military deaths and casualties in nagorno karabakh and the destruction of property and infrastructure as a result of this particular latest attacks by, by Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan also suffered significant military losses and was unable to shatter the defense lines of the nagorno karabakh self-defense army. The four-day mini-war came to an uneasy secession of fire after yet again the Russians intervened to establish a tenuous ceasefire, which at the moment is holding, but as I said, it is tenuous. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has been mandated by the United Nations to find a solution to this particular problem. And there is a group called the Minsk Group which has three permanent co-chairs headed by the United States, Russia, and France, who have over the past 22 years tried to find a negotiated peace settlement where once again, when they have again visited Yerevan, Baku, and Artsakh only in the past couple of days. Unfortunately, yet again, the OSCE refuses to appreciate that the process will continue to fail as it does not include direct negotiations between the immediate warring parties, Karabakh and Azerbaijan. The position of Azerbaijan since 1988 has been to present the right of the people of Artsakh to self-determination as a territorial dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan. That is to show Armenia as an aggressor in the eyes of the international community. The OSCE mediators have on several occasions reiterated the resumption of workable negotiation format with direct participation of the nagorno karabakh authorities was only a matter of time. This ha position has been blocked by Azerbaijan at every opportunity. They basically do not want to talk to anyone to do with anything with Karabakh. Currently, the OSCE maintains represent, representation offices in the three capitals, Stepanakert, capital of nagorno karabakh in Yerevan and in Baku. Among their responsibilities is a regular monitoring of the contact lines of Karabakh and Azerbaijan armed forces, with a view to preventing escalation and resumption of full-scale hostilities. The recent outbreak 
showed us that despite their best efforts, the OSCE was unable to prevent an escalation by Azerbaijan. One of the peculiarities of this particular conflict is the maintenance of the ceasefire line, ceasefire regime, without any international mil military involvement. The armistice is based only on the military balance of powers between the warring parties, which is the fortified lines of Artsakh and the Azeri armed forces on the opposite side. Considering the military capabilities accumulated by Azerbaijan, who has spent billions, and there's an estimate of 10 billion over five years, from their oil wealth in securing the latest military arsenal since its defeat in 1994, it is obvious that these renewed hostilities and any continuation will have grave consequences for the entire Caucasus and beyond, far, far beyond. The power play in the region with Russia, Turkey, Iran as immediate neighbors, and Western interests in the oil and gas that flow from the oil fields of the Caspian Sea to Europe and beyond has made this 11,500 square kilometers republic, approximately the size of Greater Sydney, a strategically vital piece of real estate. However, any adventurism or miscalculation by Azerbaijan, as we saw last week, and the area could ignite into a catastrophic cauldron and engulf the region and far beyond. Since the current situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, since proclaiming independence in 1991, the goals of the people of Artsakh have remained very simple and the same. To continue building a stable, open and democratic society, a state which can protect, it, protect its population and provide them with the rights and freedoms everyone, we as humans, deserve. The Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh has sustainable political institutions, a presidential system of government with the president, the government, and the members of parliament democratically elected. There have been six elections for, parliament, for parliamentarians in Karabakh since 1994. There is a multi-party political field with an active non-governmental sector. In 2006, the Republic adopted its new constitution, which consolidated all the basic principles of a sovereign, sovereignty, sovereignly democratic state and symbolized a new stage in its development. The most recent parliamentary elections in Artsakh, which happened last year in May 2015, were assessed by international observers as more free and transparent than those in many countries worldwide. And it, and it was in stark contrast to our neighbor to the east, serving as yet more evidence that the people of Artsakh have passed all the tests to be an independent state. Defined by free and fair elections and a tradition of post-electoral consensual coexistence of government and opposition, Nagorno-Karabakh's political system is irreversibly in in incompatible with that of Azerbaijan. This is one of the many reasons why an attempt to propose a com common political future for these two countries is not a realistic one. Effective government and the eradication of corruption has allowed significant achievements in Karabakh's economic development. Attractive investment policies and a flexible taxation regime has resulted in multi-million dollar foreign investments and sustainable double-digit growth. Mining, telecommunication, construction, food processing, agriculture, cattle, and sheep farming are the mainstays of Garabas economy. Traditionally agricultural, nagorno karabakh is exploring new possibilities for a multifaceted development in its economy, including the areas of energy, information and technology, diamond processing, and tourism. We come to the st stability in the South Caucasus. I alluded to the importance of Artsakh 
to regional stability. It is clear that ethno-political conflict, dissemination of aggressive nationalism, and poorly developed civil society are among the destabilizing factors in the South Caucasus, just like everywhere, everywhere else in, around the globe. Despite the ceasefire reached in 1994, which was violated last week, and once again, we, were, we had a tenuous ceasefire established, the conflicting sides remain very far from reaching an agreement. People in Karabakh are determined to continue developing as a sovereign state and are ready to assume the responsibility of being a trustful and reliable partner in the international community. After the events in Georgia in August 2008, which led to the recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the azerbaijan karabakh conflict remains the biggest challenge to long-term stability and security in the South Caucasus. Reaching a durable positive peace is a goal that is in the interests of the entire international community, including Azerbaijan. The Nagorno-Karabakh Republic people have repeatedly stated their support for peaceful negotiations with, under, uh, with Azerbaijan under the aegis of the OSCE Minsk Group and remain adherent to a constructive involvement with the international mediators with the goal of reaching a shared vision of a stable region. The idea that the world doesn't need more states expressed by some experts is erroneous since there are numerous cases of state formation after World War II and in particular in post-Soviet era, which undoubtedly shaped a better political map, making the world a safer place. Besides the recent trends in world affairs and conflict resolution support, the forfeiture of a country's authority over a certain autonomous territory, often without its con consent, if the central government appears unable to implement an effective administration based on democracy and respect of human rights. Azerbaijan has failed the test of securing the human rights of the people of nagorno karabakh These principles have, in fact, become new par paradigms in international law. Take the example of Kosovo, East, East Timor in our own backyard, Montenegro, and most recently, South Sudan. A complex of legally acceptable measures, measures frame a way to obtaining state independence for Quebec, Gibraltar, Western Sahara, New Caledonia, and elsewhere. And this is very much true about nagorno karabakh First, the people of Artsakh have conducted a, referendum, a referendum in compliance with international law. Secondly, Azerbaijani policy towards Karabakh has clearly indicated the impossibility of nagorno karabakhs coexistence with Azerbaijan within the Azeri sovereign territory. nagorno karabakh and Azerbaijan can be good neighbors, but they will never peacefully coexist in a common political administrative entity. The nagorno karabakh people have determined to have their own state. And we are looking forward to many in the world recognizing this fact. The recognition of the independence of the Republic of nagorno karabakh neither violates the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, nor threatens its existence. I cannot say the same in the case, in the contrary case. The principle of territorial integrity does not hold in the case of nagorno karabakh as part of Azerbaijan. This is the argument we hear even from our own foreign minister in Australia, who I, with all due respect, find is totally uninformed about the situation and blindly follows the edicts of Turkey and their allies Azerbaijan. 
You see, Nagorno-Karabakh has never been a part of independent Azerbaijan and withdrew from a Soviet Republic in compliance with Soviet legislation. The same legislation which provided independence also for Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the rest of the former Soviet republics to head towards a peaceful and negotiated settlement the negotiation process must be backed up by a commitment on the part of the conflicting sides to confidence building measures something that Azerbaijan refuses to do only a genuine reconciliation achieved through official contact mutual trust and elements of second track diplomacy can yield a stable peace. Today in Azerbaijan, textbooks portray Armenians as the eternal enemy. Only a, couple, a day ago, a representative in Sweden of the Azeri uh, group there had to resign because he called for the death of the dog Armenians. This is the kind of mentality this is the kind of culture which is being propagated in Azerbaijan and unfortunately to achieve peace exactly the opposite needs to be implemented we all know that the Karabakh conflict is a very complicated and difficult one to solve but the people of Nagorno-Karabakh remain optimistic they believe that reverting to the original negotiation format with Artsakh's Nagorno-Karabakh's full participation will restore the lacking balance and provide Azerbaijan with tangible incentives to act constructively. That would also credibly demonstrate Azerbaijan's readiness to coexist peacefully with Nagorno-Karabakh, regardless of the outcomes of the negotiations. To date, Azerbaijan considers anyone that visits Karabakh to be on the blacklist. I think Mr. Erdey is one of those people who is on the blacklist of Azerbaijan because he had the courage and the fortitude to go and see for himself what Karabakh was all about. The events of the past week have unfortunately shown that Azerbaijan remains resolute in its goal of achieving a final solution to the Karabakh conflict with the annihilation of, the Arts of Artsakh and its people. Richard, a few minutes ago, was saying to me, Kayla, the word annihilation is a very strong one that you're using. I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the people, sorry, the people of Karabakh will be annihilated and Artsakh will no longer exist should the Azeris be victorious in their attempts. Armenians in Artsakh, in Armenia, and in, in the diaspora, having only a hundred years ago been subjected to the final solution in the form of the 1915 genocide, Armenian genocide, perpetrated by the Ottoman Turks, are even more resolute to stop the continuing genocide. To us, Artsakh is the point where the genocide comes to an end. The state and people of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh have earned through a war that was forced upon them their victory against their oppressors through the establishment of a fully democratic state based on the rule of law with the guarantee of every human right for its citizens and all the institutions necessary for its continued growth and development, the right to have their place amongst the international family of democratic states. I will end my talk here by quoting Andrei Sakharov, the famous Russian Soviet dissident, who in 1993 said to the Azerbaijanis, Nagorno-Karabakh is a, a matter of ambition. To the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, it is a matter of life and death. And that is the reality. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, uh, Kayla. Can I begin question session? We've got about 20 minutes for questions, and that, that was a very um, intense, uh, intricate discussion you've just given us. Why do the uh, Azeris, the Azerbaijanis, why did they suddenly launch this attack on the 2nd of what, why, what was the reason for it? Uh, and what, what did they say was the reason and what was the real reason? Well, what was said was that Azerbaijan did not initiate this attack. It was actually an attack initiated by the Armenians. Anyone with half a brain would say, why would the Armenians attack Azerbaijan? What have they got to gain? They've got nothing to gain. We are a small a a state of 150,000 people against a state of 8 million people. We have virtually no resources. Our country, I don't know, I, forgive me, but I don't even remember what our GDP is. Uh, but um, Azerbaijan has, Azerbaijan's military budget over the past five years has exceeded the entire budget for Armenia. So Azerbaijan has all the resources at its disposal. And as I said over the past five years, and before that, has been buying arms from wherever they could access, from Russia, uh, from Israel, uh, and wherever they could get arms from, and have built this huge arsenal of weapons. For what purpose? Why would you build all this military might if you were not going to use it? So it really lays to, it, it challenges belief that, uh, that Armenia or, or the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh would even contemplate uh, attacking Azerbaijan. The main reason why Azerbaijan attacked, now that we've established that Azerbaijan was the attacking party, uh, the main reason why Azerbaijan attacked is basically a gentleman there, and I, pardon me, I forgot your name, but Mishali. Mishali. He he was uh, he was just talking to me about the price of oil. As all of you know, the price of oil has plummeted significantly over the past year. Uh, and probably a bit more. We are very lucky because we get cheaper petrol at the Bowsers, but, but, but it has its consequences uh, in, in other areas. And Azerbaijan's sole um, income is from oil. Over the past, since 19, over the past 25 years, they've done virtually nothing uh, to build any other form of structure to have income. And their, so, their sole source is, is oil. And having suffered a huge drop in oil prices, their budget has suffered incredibly. This has created a great um, upheaval in, social, in the social structure within Azerbaijan. And the dictator who currently rules Azerbaijan, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, is very, very concerned that his rule in that country could come to an end because of the disquiet amongst the people there. Uh, what is the best way to divert attention of your people from social unrest in the country? Let's have a war. So Mr. Aliyev had ordered his forces to attack uh, Gharapakh, nagorno Gharapakh, with uh, with the intention that he would be in the capital within three days. Um, our, our young soldiers on the, on the front lines with the ultimate price have defended <coughs> the borders to their credit. Thank you, that's a very comprehensive answer. Ian Lincoln, wait for the microphone. <clears throat> Thank you very much for paying us the compliment of preparing uh, such a, an informative address on a subject on which uh, most of us Australians have only half a brain. And it's in that context that I ask what may be a very dumb question, but 
what are the underlying, if any, religious, ethnic, ideological differences which divide Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Armenia? That's, that's a very, very important and relevant question, despite you saying that it, it's a dumb question. It's not. It, it really goes very much to the heart of, of the problem. Um, Armenians are, uh, are, Christ are Christian people. Uh, we adopted Christianity in 301 uh, as the first state to adopt Christianity in the world. So we've got a Christian uh, tradition going back 1700 years. Uh, and we, in 2001, we celebrated, 2001, am I right? Yeah, 2001, we celebrated the 1700th anniversary of Christianity in Armenia. Uh, as, a, as a state. Um, the Azeris are, um, they come, uh, Azer Azerbaijan is not a homogen homogeneous state. It has different ethnic groups within it and there's a lot of tension also building up within these ethnic groups, in particular because they are being forced into a situation of sending their young sons to the battlefront. Sorry, you wanted to ask? No, you finish your okay. answer first. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, there is that difference between the Christian nation and, uh, and an Islamic state of Azerbaijan. However, there's also an ideological uh, component to it, as you, as you mentioned. And the ideology comes from the ideology of the Young Turks, which was an ideology of um, pan-Turkism. As I said in my talk, uh, the Turkic races, the Turkic people, came from Central Asia. They were not indigenous to the Armenian plateau, or to Turkey, to current Turkey. Current Turkey was Armenian and uh, Greek uh, lands. Uh, the Turks invaded those lands in the 11th century, uh, and their dream has always been to have a state from Turkey all the way to Central Asia of uniting the Turkic people. And that is called the pan-Turkist ideology, espoused by the current president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, very much so. And, uh, as, and Armenia uh, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh are the sliver of land which divide this huge Turkic-speaking people's land. And the ideology is they cannot exist there. We have to get rid of them, so we unite with our brethren right across. John, John Hallam. Um, Microphone, I, John, wait a minute. Um, I, I guess I, I, can't, I can't look at this um, without reflexively thinking both of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but also um, of other enclaves elsewhere. Um, and I guess I'm thinking of Crimea, I'm thinking of Donetsk, um, I guess I'm also thinking of Kosovo, um, that want to be either independent or that want the borders to change. And it seems to me that there has been a great um, invoking of the inviolability of borders um, at times when that inviolability is really and truly absolutely unsupportable. Um, and that perhaps we need to change the idea of the inviolability of borders um, for an idea in which borders exist subject to the verified and verifiable wishes of the people that live in the areas that those borders affect. And that if a group of people in a, an area such as Nagorno-Karabakh or South Ossetia, or for that matter in Crimea or Donetsk, um, don't want to be part of the country that they're officially legally part of, then they are no longer officially and legally part of that country um, because their being part of that country is subject to their acknowledgement that that is indeed what they want. 
Um, can I, sorry, it was John, wasn't it? We, we take that as a statement, John, but maybe yeah, you no, want to make it. I, I, just, I, just, I just want John, uh, should I ever be given an opportunity to meet with, the, uh, with our foreign minister, to please accompany me, because I'm sure you'll, you'll put the argument a lot more eloquently than, than I ever will. So thank you so much. I have to say, at this point, uh, our foreign minister has a huge uh, portfolio to cover, and probably the, the response she's given to the present situation indicates that the people in the department simply aren't up with what's going on in that area. It's a bit like Tony Abbott wanting to shirt from Putin or <laughs> Putin or, or send, send 3,500 SAS troops into Ukraine, as if we would have any technical or, 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 or intellectual capacity to engage in that sort of stuff. That's just my comment, uh, an editorial on the side. This gentleman here, wait for the microphone, sir. And who are you? Uh, my name is uh, Mushalik. I'm running a website, crudeoilpeak.info, so I'm looking at the whole thing from the point of view of oil. Uh, for those who don't know it, there is a pipeline, three pipelines actually running um, through Azerbaijan and it's approximately there where the E is of Azerbaijan and then A and then it goes up to Tbilisi. Uh, it, it, one of the pipelines was formed by the Russians in 2008. There, there are two oil pipelines and one gas pipeline. My question is, could Armenia in Azerbaijan uh, start an all-out attack, uh, take the ultimate revenge and knock out the pipelines which uh, at the very uh, north uh, west uh, towards Tbilisi yeah. there in that so, small area yeah. is I think only 15 kilometers or yeah. so and what would be the, the geopolitical implications, what would Russia do, what would America do, what would Turkey do and what would Iran do? You've just highlighted why I said it's a, it's a flashpoint, uh, which can have international implications, uh, huge international implications. Um, the Azeri pipeline is well within the missile range of the Armenian forces, well within. And, um, and it, it can, and I hope it never comes to that, but it can be targeted and it can be blown up. On, on several on several points along that the whole line um, I think that's where BP and um, Shell and companies like that are very nervous because they've got huge investments BP BP have huge investments in Azerbaijan and uh, and they they particularly don't want any any conflict in that in that region um, Armen Armenian forces in Nagorno-Karabakh have been extremely reserved in their in their reply to the provocation that as, as recently as last week. Uh, we have given many many sol we have lost many many soldiers um, and and also civilians. Uh, however, uh, we are well aware of our responsibility as a member of the nations, international nations, um, and it would be extremely unlikely that we would, we would take such steps. But then again, if you are faced with annihilation, what do you do? We all pray that we never get to that point to see that day. Other questions? Yes, gentlemen at the back. Wait for the microphone, sir. Um, hello, my name is Peter Dorian. I'm a visitor, so totally um, uneducated in the area of the Caucasus. You mentioned between the 20s and the 90s, the Azeri population in Nagorno Karabakh went up from 3% to 21%. What are those people doing now? Have the, are they staying in the Gora Karapas? Have they moved back to Azerbaijan? And if they haven't, are they in favour of the war 
on the opposite side. Uh, welcome, Peter. Good to have you with us. Um, and thank you for the lecture. It's <laughs> thank you. Um, the, the population, of, uh, you are correct, there was a, um, uh, a sizable minority uh, Azeri population in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, however, since, uh, since the end of the war, uh, as soon as the war basically, the forced war upon the people of Karabakh, uh, we had a population of 450,000 Armenians in Azerbaijan. And I alluded to the pogroms that uh, happened there. And uh, people there did not feel safe to stay in Azerbaijan. And they all moved to Armenia and to Karabakh. Uh, in the case of the Azeris, they also did not feel safe and they moved to Azerbaijan. The contrast, I, I, I like to contrast the issue of refugees. When the Armenians from uh, Azerbaijan uh, moved to Armenia, uh, the Armenian people and the government put in every effort to find them accommodation, to find them uh, work to give them their dignity and allow them to continue their lives as normal human beings with, uh, with the rights of uh, we all take for granted as human beings. The Azeris, unfortunately, have moved these populations just to the other side of the border and for 22 years have been keeping them in uh, train wagons uh, and containers, most of them. Uh, with the sole purpose of continuing to generate animosity, continuing to generate uh, ill feelings towards the Armenians. Um, these people are sick and tired of being left there, neglected, living in those, in those conditions. However, Ilham Aliyev is prepared to take billions out of his country into offshore accounts, uh, and he's got a lot more capacity to be able to accommodate his population throughout Azerbaijan uh, than Armenia had, uh, but unfortunately that's the reality. That's, that's where they are. Other quick, yes, there's a question at the back. There are two. The first, this lady here. No, you first, madam. I noticed you first. Thank you. Um, Kate Blanchin, Carlo, it was an excellent speech. Um, this might be a silly question, and I know I have an Armenian background, but I have no um, idea of this. Um, I understand they want to be an independent state. I understand they have their own government, their own president, um, it, and they, but they are recognized by certain other nations. They're not, not? Re they're not recognized by any nation in the world, not even Armenia. Not, because that was my question. How come they don't, you know, group with Armenia and become part of Armenia? Why do they have to stay as a tiny little state? Okay. The Armenian, the reason why Armenia has not recognized, uh, recognized Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent republic is a very simple one. It is not to provoke the ignition of the region. Uh, Armenia is extremely cautious that if they were to recognize the state, that would give Azerbaijan an excuse to declare an all-out war and the consequences could be uh, catastrophic, will be catastrophic, not could be, will be catastrophic for the region uh, and, 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 as I said, far beyond. And that is the reason why Armenia has not recognized. However, in this, in this recent conflict, uh, in this past few days, the Armenian president made it very clear, Seir Sarkisyan made it very clear, that if Azerbaijan was to continue violating the ceasefire, he would be forced into recognizing Artsakh Karabakh as an independent state. As opposed to being part of Azerbaijan now. That's what Armenia recognizes no, it no, as. No, as a, uh, Armenia does not recognize it as part of Azerbaijan. What does it recognize it as? At the moment, a state in limbo uh, with uh, the intention of having the international community 
recognise it, and with Armenia recognising it as an independent state. Thank you for that. That's important to know. Yes, please, madam, finish, but hold the microphone up. We can't hear you properly. Is that the same recognition that like, the United States or Russia or anyone else feels the same way about that, that it's in limbo? Uh, unfortunately, now, with the Russians, they're ambivalent in their approach. I don't know exactly, but I'll give you the foreign policy uh, position of Australia, which which is a, a fairly um, middle-powered state, and, and that would be reflected quite a bit. The, the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Parliament only about two months ago, uh, in answer to a question from Mr. Luke Simpkins, who is a Western Australian parliamentarian and has become the spokesperson for the Azeri government in Australia, uh, replied that Australian foreign policy does not recognise the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent state, and uh, and would encourage uh, and recognise and does not want to see the inviolability of the uh, of the uh, sovereign integrity of Azerbaijan uh, being in any way altered, and that, uh, however, she called for for all parties to negotiate their differences through the OSCE Minsk Group. So that's, that's Australian policy. And I would say that would be reflected worldwide at the moment, right across the world. Yeah. Question uh, down here first. Uh, no, you've had a go, sir. I'll, I'll, there's someone back, back there who, no, no hand up anymore. Yeah. All right, we come. Uh, this gentleman here first, please. Very and then, that you, call me then you, yes. <laughs> sir, okay. sir Julitsky, visitor. Uh, thank you very much for a most informative uh, presentation. Uh, you have spoken in terms of principle and international legality. Uh, unfortunately, international legality is sometimes a fiction, but a delightful fiction, which makes us feel better. Uh, the attitude of the great powers is of primary importance. Uh, Turkey's attitude is fairly clear. Uh, the Russian Federation is sympathetic but compromised because if you start discussing uh, self-determination of discrete regions, there may be some embarrassing questions about Chechnya, and let alone other places. Uh, the a very important uh, actor in all of this is the United States of America. Uh, what is their deep position? And perhaps the real question is, what is the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh? Does it have a large public square? And has Mac uh, Madam Victoria Newland been observed handing out sandwiches recently? <laughs> um, I mean... I, I will not argue with a lawyer about, uh, about international law, far from it. I'm, I'm just a very simple uh, person who has no, no ideas about those issues. Uh, but rightly so, um, whatever you said is uh, spot on. The, the issue uh, as far as um, the position of the United States is uh, the administration uh, in the United States holds virtually the same view uh, as, uh, as our foreign affairs here does. Um, however, we do have a number of uh, senators and congressmen and women who support very much the independence of uh, nagorno karabakh I'd like to come back to the position of Turkey. You said that we know what the Turkish position is. I don't think everyone does know what Turkey, the Turkish position is. The Turkish position is one of inciting the Azeris and supporting them to the hilt and doing so publicly. Um, the Prime Minister Davutoglu, the President Erdogan, even after these recent um, flare up, uh, said to the world that we will support 
our brethren, our Azeri brethren, to the end. At the same time, in the same breath, Mr. Erdogan complained that Armenia, the three million little state of 33,000 square kilometers, was the greatest threat to international peace. <laughs> to international peace, not, not to the region. We're talking world peace here. The gentleman said that Armenia is the greatest threat, not a threat, the greatest threat to international peace. There lies Turkey's position. Turkey, as I said, in line with their brethren in Azerbaijan, have a policy to fulfill their pan-Turkist dream of uniting the Turkic people. And Armenia in the middle cannot exist. We have time for one final question from Reinhard. Wait for the microphone, please. Herr Rusch. Is it on? Yes. Thank you very much for your lecture. I just have one question. And uh, according to, let's say, traditional uh, international law, there are three elements for a state. It's the government, Staatsgewalt, then the territory, and the people. You said there is a government, and of course there's uh, the, the people in your territory. And, but the question, my question is, is there an effective border control or um, uh, let's say that they could speak of that one could speak of a state territory, the third element necessary? Uh, I'll just answer that very simply by saying on, on April 2, a few days ago, that border, which is the state territory of Nagorno Karabakh, was attacked by Azerbaijan and was attacked by all its might. Um, tanks, helicopters, planes, drones, uh, artillery, missiles, uh, all these weaponry was used to attack. The border stood firm because the nagorno karabakh Defense Army was able to repel those attacks. So that border is defined. We have a border and it is our country. Thank you for that. Uh, look, thanks so much, uh, uh, it, Kayla. It's been very interesting, and I'd like to ask uh, one of our interns, Alex Galitsky, to come up and propose a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's event and for taking an interest in the past, present, and future of Artsakh. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Jonathan O'Day MP for attending tonight and for his recent commemoration of the victims of the Sumgaid massacres perpetrated by the Azeri government against the Armenian people of Nagorno Karabakh in 1988, and for his long-time support for the self-determination and independence of Artsakh. I'd also like to thank Trent Zimmerman MP. Unfortunately, he cannot be here tonight, but in a letter addressed to me, reaffirmed his support for our community by saying that if we allow the actions of the past to be forgotten and silenced, we risk those being committed again. Um, it's my privilege to, on behalf of the AAA of New South Wales, extend a vote of thanks to Mr. Kailar Mikalyan. I think institutions like the AAA are at their best when they can provide a voice to issues which aren't heard or are silenced in the public debate. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, this issue has become important in the public debate, but for all the wrong reasons. Instead of talking about the self-determination of Artsakh, we talk about conflict and territorial, territorial issues. Instead of looking at the successes of democracy and of self-determination, we look at death toll. Now, I think this goes to what Kailar alluded to in his discussion of the two arms of international relations. That on one hand, we have Artsakh, a nation which effectively exemplifies the expected outcomes of democratic self-determination. A nation that despite centuries of imperialist occupation, despite recent decades of insecurity, has managed to maintain and develop democratic institutions. And on the other hand, we have an oil-rich, geostrategically significant nation run by a dictator, supported by an international community which has consistently put its self-interests above the rights of those most vulnerable. Now we, as an Australian community, regardless of whether or not we're Armenian, have a responsibility to ensure international norms and laws are not subject to political convenience, but they're comp that they are applied consistently and universally to ensure that those they were designed to protect are not abandoned. Now, I believe that this platform here is a great step forward in that direction. 
that because I was at a protest on Friday outside the Azeri embassy in Canberra against the war crimes committed by the Azeri regime against nagorno karabakh And the primary point that came out of that was the need not only to educate ourselves, but to educate the Australian community and to educate our opposition. Because while the diaspora community is by far the greatest resource of the Armenian people, that in itself is not enough. So I'd like to thank the AWIA as well for providing this platform for discussion. Because I believe this is a very constructive step forward in engaging in public diplomacy and by raising awareness and understanding of these issues in the public debate. So once again, on behalf of the AWIA, I thank you, Kalar Mikalyan, for, your, for educating us here tonight, and I wish you success in your role as permanent representative of Artsakh to Australia. Thank you.